welcome to viewers in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and around the world. I am Violet Gonda, and will be facilitating this special discussion on the implications of the Mozambique security crisis for Zimbabwe and the rest of Southern Africa. This important dialogue is brought to you by the group Politics and Beyond. This is a community of young Zimbabwean professionals and academics interested in socio-economic and political issues of the country and the region. There is a deepening crisis in the northern part of Mozambique where insurgents have unleashed a reign of terror in Cabo Delgado and Mozambique's security situation is spiraling out of control. What does this mean for Zimbabwe's stability? What measures can Zimbabwe and other neighbors take to assist Mozambique and to preempt the violence from spilling into the rest of the region? We have four speakers who will each have five minutes to talk about specific issues relating to this conflict. And after that, I will uh, make the discussion more interactive. I will then ask the speakers some questions and also facilitate questions and would like to ask uh, uh, questions uh, directly, please raise your hands um, and we will try and get as many people to participate as possible. I will also uh, take questions sent through the uh, Facebook, um, uh, Open Pali uh, ZW Facebook page. So we will go straight into it. We are pleased to be joined by Professor Adriano Novungu from the Center for Democracy and Development in Mozambique. We have Brian Kagoro, an international development expert and CEO of Ohai Africa Solutions. Dr. Alex Magaisa, who is a UK-based Zimbabwean academic and analyst. Piers Pigou, who is an international crisis group Southern African consultant. Welcome all. Now, our first speaker is Professor Adriana Novunga, who is, as I said, from the Center for Democracy and Development, or CD, CDD. His brief is on the regional and Zimbabwe implications of Mozambique's double crisis, Islamist insurgency in the northern Cabo Delgado, and the civil war in the central part of the country. It's over to you, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon or evening, according to uh, the region where uh, where you are open, you, are, uh, you can hear me. Um, Mozambique is going through um, a double crisis. The first one is um, uh, the ongoing uh, civil war. This um, uh, civil war um, it uh, came to an end in 1992 from um, uh, the General Peace Accord that was signed in Rome, which paved a way for um, the, uh, the Second Republic in Mozambique, uh, the Democratic Republic, which allowed the participation and the renown to be turned um, into a political party to participate. That um, has been ongoing, but that conflict uh, although there was a peace agreement, there were um, uh, regular elections, and Mozambique is internationally applauded uh, for organizing regular elections. Um, but the conflict as such, um, it has never come to an end. And there is a residual force in the central part of the country um, that after the passing of the uh, historic leader of Renamo, um, Afonso Lakama, it has um, at the regular intervals attacking um, civilians, uh, creating havoc in the central part of the country, in border with uh, um, in the Manica land, in the border with uh, with Zimbabwe, uh, creating lots of problems in terms of uh, transport. In terms. Of The hinterland is not only Zimbabwe, but also Malawi um, and Zambia. So this, um, uh, an ongoing um, civil war 
uh, it is creating much havoc there with serious implications to neighboring countries, particularly Zimbabwe, um, which um, has a pipeline um, um, uh, straight from Baira to Zim, um, but also in terms of um, access to electricity. Um, uh, Zimbabwe's electricity comes uh, mostly from Mozambique from the dead um, uh, dam. And um, uh, this conflict, it has serious implications, um, not only in terms of the livelihoods of the people there, um, with uh, lots of people uh, crossing the border to see, um, adding to the existing uh, Zim problems, but also the lack of development due to this conflict uh, in the Mozambique side, it affects, um, obviously, uh, Zim. So this is the conflict that affects the most dynamics um, in Zim. This is the first. Uh, the second and the most recent is the uh, insurgency in Cabo Delgado. Mozambique was moving um, towards um, uh, monetization of its um, uh, wealthy class uh, gas reserves uh, in the north. Um, it was um, expected uh, that Mozambique by now um, would be um, eyeing at the first super revenues uh, coming um, uh, from gas, um, not only um, uh, in terms of monetization, revenues for government um, from the upstream dynamics, uh, but the conflict, it is really affecting the um, developments there. From the upstream, um, the one of the most important um, international oil companies that is active in the area has put its uh, final investment decision on hold due to the um, insurgency that is creating havoc in that area. And, and this, um, this decision to uh, put uh, the final investment decision on hold, it is seriously affecting uh, possibilities uh, of Mozambique to quickly uh, benefit, but not only that, it's affecting neighboring countries um, in terms of uh, not only instability, uh, we are talking of an Islamist um, military um, uh, insurgency, um, which um, is expanding uh, to other provinces. In all these provinces, they uh, border with the neighboring countries. Talk about Malawi, talk about Tanzania um, in the northern part. So uh, in terms of security, in terms of stability, it is um, indeed creating havoc. But economically speaking, um, uh, the, the fact that this major, um, which is Exxon, has decided to put a final investment decision on hold upstream, um, it prevented much needed um, uh, FDI uh, to come to Mozambique and with it um, there, I mean, there is cut um, in jobs. Um, there is also um, um, the, the delayed uh, possibilities of Mozambique um, uh, cashing uh, important um, uh, revenues, which are important to boost Mozambique's economy, but also um, <coughs> at the midstream, it does prevent, does preventing uh, the much needed um, um, uh, local content opportunities for uh, national um, and regional uh, companies to supply to um, this industry. So um, it was expected that um, Zimbabwe's, uh, Malawians, and also South African uh, small and medium companies, they would be part of the uh, supply chain. Uh, for the industry, um, and also it expected that um, gas from uh, northern Mozambique, mm -hmm. it would um, benefit not only Mozambique, but the region in terms of bringing down um, the cost of electricity, in terms of uh, bringing down the cost mm -hmm. of um, the cost of fertilizers, also bring down um, um, uh, the cost of GTL, uh, which is um, a gas to liquid. I'm talking about um, uh, diesel um, uh, because uh, Mozambique is also expiring to, um, um, to transform part of its gas into, um, uh, into diesel and, um, and fuel, etc. cetera. So uh, with this on hold, not only Mozambique is not benefiting, but the region, 
and um, Zimbabwe's um, uh, um, uh, capacity I mean, and um, uh, important people uh, from Zimbabwe were the ones who um, were supporting um, intellectually, but they were supporting in terms of skills, capacities, etc., to have jobs and also um, uh, develop and get the skills, uh, develop um, their, uh, their industries. But all this is put on hold. So not only in terms of security, but also economically speaking, the conflict is putting on hold important projects which will further delay Mozambique's uh, development on the one hand. On the other hand, the region, uh, not only Zimbabwe, is also not benefiting from what would uh, be expected as um, uh, the, uh, the game changer, not only for Mozambique, but from the region. So my argument is that this conflict is seriously affecting the development of what uh, was being seen, not only as Mozambique's, but as regional and Zimbabwe's uh, game changer, economically speaking. Thank you very much, Professor Adriano Novunga from the Center for Democracy and uh, Development. Our next speaker is Brian Kagoro, who will give us his thoughts on geopolitics. <laughs> Um, geoeconomics and history of uh, militarization and insurgency in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Brian? Uh, thank you, Violet, uh, and thank you, um, Helen and Tatenda, and the network that has brought us together. Um, I think that as we reflect on Mozambique, uh, and in particular on the insurgency in the north, it's useful that we understand the geopolitical moment that we're in which is uh, characterized by the global contestation by former Cold War enemies, uh, but now uh, new hegemons, uh, to which we have added the Middle East, UAE uh, and uh, Turkey and others, and Russia's uh, resurgent uh, power and interest in Africa, and China, of course, uh, and, and, the, the, and India. So in a sense, the geoeconomic trend that we are looking at is not the singular which country is interested in Mozambique, and I'll walk us through that. And as we reflect on Mozambique, we must, beyond what I think Adriano has articulately uh, placed on the table, we must also look at the question, broadly speaking, of labor migration, capital migration, and also the history of forced labor and displacement both as a result of the Renamo insurgency and the new insurgency on the border with Tanzania. And of course, for Zimbabwe, as already said, uh, the electricity, port access, and other interests. I wanted to suggest to you that the history of the two countries, in Violet, is very interested in, interesting in the sense that um, instability in Mozambique always had its roots in Zimbabwe, or Zimbabwe's geoeconomic and geopolitical interest. Uh, we may dispute on the basis of history, uh, the genesis of Renamo, but it is indisputable from the classified Rhodesian documents and CIA files that um, Renamo arose first as an anti-communist insurgency created or backed by the Rhodesian CIO, uh, and that the Rhodesians and the apartheid South Africa establishments continued to support Renamo, both uh, and also Renamo had support from Western Germany, which was logistical support, and uh, American conservative who tried to get official American support for it, and it had curiously support from Kamuzubanda in the 1980s and support for, by some elements within uh, Zimbabwe. So if you if you look at that particular component, you may be interested in knowing who is interested in Mozambique. Uh, so the leading investors are UAE, Mauritius, China, Italy, USA, South Africa, Portugal, and Turkey. In what sectors are they invested in? Mining, hydrocarbons, energy, logistics, retail, real estate, coal, tourism, telecommunications, and infrastructure. If you think about the length and breadth of this investment, relate to it, relate them to Mozambique's debt. Mozambique should be floating in money with these investments, 
Mozambicans should have more jobs than they need, right? The commercial debt of Mozambique sits at about 1.9 billion. We're talking about over 700 million of the euro bond and the 600 odd million that they owe to the Swiss and they owe money to the Russian state bank, uh, VTB, the 530 million and the bilateral and concessional debts that they owe to the bank uh, and the fund all upward of about 8 billion. And to Paris club countries, another huge amount. To China, Exim Bank, another huge amount. And it seems to me that it's something that doesn't make sense. The country that's receiving so much investment keeps borrowing in order to pay for basic infrastructure. What are the investors bringing? So if you look quickly at the Russian interest from mining sector that I think we already talked about. So they have interest in hydrocarbon and also in gold, uh, through no gold. I think that um, Prof talked about it. And in the financial sector, I mean, VTB Bank was trying to set up a, a bank to help with processing uh, earnings that are yet to be accrued, you know, because we haven't started this offshore gas mining um, and their interest together with the Gazprom Bank. Uh, and it, it seems to me that the control of the financial services sector, the control of the ports, the control of the energy sector. I think that uh, Adriano already respond, talked about CPMZ, which is a joint uh, initiative that brings um, meant to bring fuel from Feruca, uh, from Vaira through the Feruca refinery in Tare. And who is who in Zimbabwe is invested in that uh, CPMZ company, right? And how it will move all the way to Ndola in Zambia, Francistown in Botswana. Uh, we will be tracking not just military support, which is uh, hard power, or economic support, which is the soft power. I think we need to be tracking broadly what are the interests beyond this. And I mean, if time permitted, we could go into a huge discussion about the Chinese interests, uh, the Turkish interests. Uh, I think uh, Adriano already referred to Total, Exxon Mobile, uh, the American interests. Um, so it seems to me we must therefore answer the simpler, much simpler question, Violet. And that much simpler question is this. And I, I, and I want to, what are those intersections in the two countries, right? What are those things that join us, our countries uh, together, right? And why is this important for us to be having uh, this uh, uh, a conversation in the context of geopolitics and geoeconomics? I want to suggest to you uh, and to those who are listening the following, that um, uh, if UAE is the third largest exporter of diverse products to Mozambique, it has invested over $1 billion, right? It's focusing on energy, logistics, and port management, right? And if its volume of trade is upward of $700 million, UAE has interest in Mozambique. Turkey, which has invested over 270 million in agriculture, infrastructure, and energy, it has interest, right? And that interest perhaps explains the following questions, and I'm preparing to, to end now. The question of corruption within the Mozambican state, the resurgence of clientelism and ethno-regionalism in Mozambican governance, the politics of primitive accumulation that's transnational, that goes beyond Mozambique, spills into Zimbabwe and beyond. And it explains also what may appear to most Mozambicans willful colonization or recolonization of Mozambique. And what does this mean in terms of uh, our thinking? So historically, our relations were fashioned by wartime solidarity and sacrifice. Uh, I am most grateful, as many Zimbabweans ought to be, for Mozambique's sacrifices that brought us liberation. But we saw in the Baira Corridor defense project, the soldierization of the Zimbabwean economy, and also the bringing in of uh, not just soldiers into the economy, but military interests uh, in the economy. So the arm's length interest in the pipeline the soldierized corruption that we began to see, security sectors' interest in Noxim in Zimbabwe, and similar scandals in Mozambique. The growth of new political oligarchs and the unintended consequence where 
as all this was going on, the looting which was not anchored in production, uh, white South African capital, if there's any uh, capital as a race, capital dominated by formerly uh, groups of white South Africans came into Mozambique and harvested the uh, dividends of peace. So where would this take us when we're looking at the current conflict? I think solidarity and mutual security interest will continue to predominate, right? And I think that there is a, 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 a positive side to this. But the conflation of securocracy, economy, and politics in both Mozambique and Zimbabwe is going to be a factor that will determine democracy and the openness of those societies. As we are seeing increasingly the militarization of politics and the politicization of militaries linked to the accumulation project and the prospect of wealth gained from uh, the, the, the sort of uh, opportunities, both in northern Mozambique, but in parts of Zimbabwe. So this will bring new dimensions of opacity and corruption. And add to this what northern Mozambique is bringing to southern Africa as a new dimension, politicized Islam, which inevitably is going to meet with conservative Christianity. And this will internationalize what we are describing as a domestic conflict, because we're going to have conservative Christians from Russia, conservative Christians from America, and from the rest of the continent, seeing uh, their religion as under threat from a particularly politicized and violent version of Islamic uh, fundamentalism. So what will this mean for geopolitical security uh, and for wealth interests? I suspect violent. That what essentially means is because we can't protect ourselves, we're going to have the superpowers offer to protect us using drones and other forms of complex technology. There's already been an experiment in Mozambique with Russian mercenaries. I think going into the future, there's going to be a robust case made for strengthening and establishing a much bigger United States of America base, a Chinese base, and a Russian, all in order to protect us. And this is my take on what this portends for us. Great insights. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Brian Kagoro, who is an international development expert and uh, CEO of Ohio Africa Solutions. Um, before I go to the next speaker, I would just like to um, remind everyone, because I'm seeing messages that I'm getting <laughs> via WhatsApp, that we will, uh, right now, chats are disabled, but we will open them up and we will get your views in the um, second segment once we've heard from all our speakers. Up next is Dr. Alex Magaisa, who will focus on implications for Zimbabwe's constitutional arrangements, role of the military, legal aspects of um, uh, development, such as role of parliament and budgetary economic imp implementations or implications. And uh, he will also draw comparisons with previous military adventures in Mozambique, DRC, and uh, various peacekeeping missions around the world. Alex. Thank you very much, uh, Violet. Uh, thank you to Tatenta and Helen and their group. I also wish to thank uh, Adriano and Brian for giving us a very broad and uh, rich uh, contextual background of the crisis in Mozambique. Um, Violet, thank you. My, my title was very ambitious because we were supposed to have more time. <laughs> I won't be able to cover all that in five minutes. Um, but what I'm going to try and do is to uh, synthesize everything that I was going to say. The theme of my own brief is simply to focus on the Zimbabwean side. Brian and Adriano have given us a very good, broad international dimension to the crisis in Mozambique. So I'm looking at this more specifically uh, from the Zimbabwean side, uh, but focusing a lot on the boring side of the law and uh, probably just say a little bit about the uh, economic aspects of it. Um, first of all, I wish to point out that the crisis in Mozambique is obviously not just a national crisis. It is a, it is a regional crisis, and this is why the countries of the Southern African region, the Sadiq countries, came together there was a meeting uh, of the SADC, uh, the organ, the Troika, on the 19th of May, 2020, 
which I think is the official way of doing things. Uh, it's more transparent. Uh, it shows the regional governance architecture uh, coming into play in, in trying to deal with this, uh, with this crisis. And that Troika made some important resolutions concerning the events in Mozambique. So firstly, it was an official acknowledgement from the uh, SADC uh, Troika from the organ uh, of the crisis in Mozambique. But also more importantly, paragraph nine of the resolutions as I read it, uh, makes it very specific that SADC commits itself to support the government of Mozambique uh, in its fight against terrorism and the armed groups in Cabo Delgado. Now, it's very important for us to understand language matters, language matters, terminology matters. The moment that this is described as terrorism and armed groups, this assumes a dimension that is not only of interest to the local, to the domestic or to the regional, but it also becomes an international issue. It becomes an international issue which attracts the attention uh, of many other countries, including the superpowers that Brian and Adriano have referred to, including also global corporations, which have an interest in this matter. So that's the first uh, thing, which is the regional aspect and the sort of legal governance architecture and how it has responded to the uh, crisis in Mozambique. The second thing I want to talk about is our constitutional arrangements in Zimbabwe. What would happen? Because now we have got a framework, which is that uh, SADC has been asked to assist in Mozambique, and SADC has committed itself that it will uh, assist uh, Mozambique. So how will Zimbabwe assist Mozambique if it has to intervene and provide that assistance? Now, um, the constitution of Zimbabwe provides for uh, powers for the president to uh, invoke those powers in order to deploy uh, members of the defense forces. Uh, he does so with the cooperation of parliament. The relevant provisions are section 213 and section 214 of the constitution of Zimbabwe. They are important aspects because they tell us why the president would deploy troops in a foreign country. And there are two basic reasons which should be of relevance to this particular crisis in Mozambique. The first one is that the president may deploy armed forces in order to defend the territorial integrity of a foreign country. So if the crisis in Cabo Delgado is affecting the territorial integrity of our neighbors, that may be a good reason to intervene and support the government of Mozambique. But there is also a second reason, which is the president may deploy troops in order to defend Zimbabwe's national security or Zimbabwe's national interests. And I think that Adriano and Brian have given us a good context, the good contextual reasons why the crisis in Cabo Delgado should be of interest to neighboring countries. And therefore, it also impacts on Zimbabwe's national security, uh, but also importantly, it may impact on Zimbabwe's uh, national interest. So uh, even if we are not talking about Cabo Delgado, we are talking about the crisis that is uh, Professor Adriano has referred to uh, caused by the RENAMO or the armed groups in central Mozambique, uh, the national, the pipeline to Baira, uh, and, and you know, all the relationships that we have as neighboring countries. But of course, there are also other aspects, solidarity, uh, SADC obligations, protecting each other. Uh, but also importantly, we never forget the historical ties between our two countries and the obligations uh, that we owe each other. Uh, the Mozambicans uh, were very helpful to Zimbabwe in its fight for independence. They paid a huge price for that. Uh, that is not to say that a debt never ends, but a debt between friends is one uh, that is ever present. And so Zimbabweans, uh, you know, are stand ready to assist uh, our brothers and sisters in Mozambique, if anything, also because you want to prevent contagion that might take place in the event that the crisis in Mozambique uh, gets out of hand. 
Right, so that is the deployment aspect. The third aspect is the accountability. Uh, we have armed, we have our soldiers, we have our security forces, uh, and, and there are good reasons why they may be deployed in a neighboring country, as we have seen. However, there must also be accountability, and this is a problem that we had in previous wars. Wars such as our intervention in the DRC 20 years ago, which is still shrouded in secrecy. A lot of people have no idea what sort of casualties in that war. A lot of people have no idea how much was spent in that war. A lot of people have no idea what Zimbabwe gained from participating in that war. So it's absolutely important, in my opinion, for Zimbabwe to be able to have proper accountability mechanisms. In terms of our law, Parliament must be informed and in appropriate detail the reasons for deployment by the president. This is important because then it helps. Alex, us. please, please, can you just hold on for a second? May I remind everyone uh, to uh, mute your mics, please, so that we don't have any disturbances or disruptions. So please, can you all mute your mics? Sorry about that, Alex. You're welcome. I, I thought I was having competition there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if people listening heard what I was saying, but basically I was talking about political accountability. That in terms of our law, the president is supposed to inform parliament promptly and in appropriate detail the reasons for the deployment and also where the troops are being deployed. Then finally, as I conclude, the issue of economic uh, accountability and economic governance. War is costly. War costs money. And unfortunately, as everybody knows, Zimbabwe is in the doldrums economically. We are struggling. The economy is tanking and uh, we have serious challenges. So a lot of people would be asking, yes, Alex, you are saying that there are good reasons for deployment. Yes, Brian, yes, uh, Adriano, you've all talked about the good reasons why there should be cooperation and assistance. But how are we going to fund this war? Uh, and this is where my point connects with what Brian has said, which is that in the absence of our ability to support our war, this state then will open up opportunities for other powers, for other countries who are better placed than us to say, oh, we can assist and we can help you with this and that. This is international terrorism. We all have an interest. Corporations must also, might also become involved. We have the money. You know, there are corporations that have more money than our countries. They will say that we are able to support you. But then, of course, we must also ask ourselves, uh, what is the price that comes with such assistance? And, and so that's where I will end. Uh, that, number one, uh, it's important for solidarity purposes to assist each other. There are good reasons and there are good grounds in our constitution to support an intervention if it's done properly. However, the question is the economic implications of such an exercise and where the money will come from in order to support our intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex Magaisa, who's a UK-based Zimbabwean academic and analyst. Our last speaker is the International Crisis Group, a Southern African consultant, P.S. Pergu. He will use some of his time to reflect on key issues that have already been raised by the other participants and also look at the security challenges more broadly for Southern Africa and SADC. Piers? Thanks very much, uh, Violet, and, and thanks to the previous speakers and to the organizers. And uh, I hope this is a useful uh, input because I'm going to respond to some of the issues that have been raised. But I also think it's important to, to put some broader context about the development of the crisis uh, and the evolution of the crisis uh, in, in Mozambique. We've seen in the last, particularly nine months, a serious escalation of this crisis. And we've seen Mozambique, which has been trying to address this domestically and then with, in terms of bilateral uh, relations and reaching out to, for assistance, uh, for uh, security and intelligence uh, support, uh, that this now moving towards a formal request from SADC uh, in relation to the Troika meeting that happened in Harare uh, last month. The language uh, in the Troika statement is unprecedented as far as I can see. 
Uh, it's a green light for bilateral support from any member state, uh, but it is also a test for, uh, and I think the first serious test if we exclude the uh, current security commitments in the DRC with the Force Intervention Brigade, with, where three SADC uh, countries uh, are uh, providing troops. This is the first major test in the region for SADC's peace and security architecture. Uh, what we've seen uh, thus far, uh, it seems to me, is, is uh, a response, not really a, la not, not, a, not a keen sense of urgency in response. Uh, we understand that the chiefs of staff of uh, SADC member countries' uh, defense forces are meeting virtually next week. Uh, we understand that South Africa is in discussions, or if you listen to Minister Pandor, negotiating with Mozambique. Uh, to see how it can best assist in this situation. Meanwhile, uh, Mozambican security forces uh, operating with the aerial support of the private military company, the Dyke Advisory Group, uh, have been conducting operations since the beginning of April in a first sustained pushback to an insurgency that has rapidly uh, extended and expanded uh, in capacity uh, and in scope. Uh, we now have over 400 incidents recorded since the insurgency started at the beginning of 20, uh, sorry, at the end of 2017. And this has escalated, as I said, in the last nine months with a, a great deal of severity. There has also been the added factor of Islamic State uh, claims to, uh, I think, approximately 40 incidents now since June of last year. And we've seen a expansion of Islamic State propaganda and fellow traveler uh, propaganda uh, for I IS. Now, this, of course, has given a very strong Islamist flavor to the insurgency, uh, but I think there is a significant disagreement, or should I say we have a long way to go before we get an accurate weighting of the push and pull factors that are contributing to the insurgency itself. Now, Mozambique itself, whose security forces are quite clearly not fit for purpose and will require significant support and investment in the medium to long term to be able to take over that uh, responsibility uh, uh, effectively in terms of feeding into a long term security solution. And we're thinking beyond hard security, but human security issues. Uh, the, the SADC is going to have to look and the region is going to have to look at a long term intervention uh, uh, in that area in terms of support. Whether or not it comes in and the private military company uh, pulls back uh, remains to be seen. And of course, we know that people are questioning the legality of the Dyke Advisory Group's presence there. And that's something that could possibly be spoken about as well. Uh, and the relationship between the leader of that group and the president of Zimbabwe and Zimbabwean military, which has generated a lot of speculation about maybe a very specific role that Zimbabwe can play uh, in the counterinsurgency. The questions, of course, of who's going to pay, which were raised by Alex, uh, are, are extremely important because certainly the Zimbabwean government uh, is not in a situation to pay. The, private, the, the Mozambicans, who are paying, we understand, two, two and a half million dollars a month to the current PMC, uh, and we don't know where that money comes from either and how that's accounted for within the, uh, the Mozambique fiscus. Uh, is also a big issue. So we have to also keep our eye out, and I would certainly agree with what Brian Kogoro was saying about developing our understanding of the political economy, domestic, regional, and international actors, and the interrelationship between those actors. To understand the corporate clientelist race relations in Mozambique and how they stretch across the border inside the region as well. Uh, I wanted to say a couple of things about some of the other push-pull factors and the humanitarian consequences. Uh, and then I'll finish off uh, with a couple of other comments. The Islamist nature of this insurgency is interesting because it started really uh, generated from an internal dynamic within Islamic communities, Islamist communities in Cabo, Cabo Delgado. And the notion that this is a, uh, that Christians may be being targeted, for example, uh, in this situation is, is not as straightforward as some may seem. In fact, Christian infrastructure has been but one of many targets uh, that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years. The insurgents have generally looked to destroy 
uh, state infrastructure and symbols of state. They've robbed banks. Uh, they've destroyed communications infrastructure and so forth. Uh, so, you know, we have to be careful to see in terms of longer term dispute resolution options and so forth, what uh, can be done in terms of engaging with uh, the, uh, uh, the Muslim community in Mozambique and beyond and, and Tanzania as well in relation to understanding those dynamics as it relates to, to uh, the actual insurgency uh, and the insurgents that are involved and the external elements that the Mozambican state is now accusing of being responsible for this. Remember, up to March this year, the Mozambican state said this was a criminal, uh, uh, this was a criminal enterprise up, up there. They effectively have had to respond to regional leadership saying that there is an Islamist threat. Uh, but I still think that we are still finding our way to understand the true nature of, of, uh, of the threat. Uh, I do want to say something about the humanitarian situation because that is uh, extremely uh, problematic and of course resonates with some of the struggles and difficulties in Zimbabwe as well. But you now have almost a tenth of the population directly affected as, as IDPs, internally displaced persons in Cabo Delgado, uh, over 210,000 now and probably at least 100,000 more affected by that in host communities. Certainly what we're seeing, and we're seeing much more information about the humanitarian situation, is extremely disturbing in terms of food security and so forth. Remember, this area was very badly affected by Cyclone Idai uh, and Cyclone Kenneth last year. And uh, it does appear now that, uh, uh, you know, I, certainly speaking uh, to a few people working in the humanitarian sector, that we are going to get a, uh, this is going to be a long-term challenge as well. For, for Mozambique. Uh, so what are the impacts or the ramifications for the region more generally? Uh, we're dealing with an insurgency and, and, and I want to go back to the IS. Sorry, we, we, we see similarities with the early franchising of Islamic State in other parts of the world, particularly in West Africa, with the Islamic State West Africa province. Uh, and it is unlikely that we're going to see uh, any kind of reduction in at least propaganda uh, coming out of IS uh, propaganda channels. But the question for many people is what are the nature, what is the nature of other links? And trying to understand that in relation to supplies, financing, and so forth. And this is where a lot more work has to be done. Intelligence communities uh, have to be fit for purpose, uh, and there has to be coordination within the region on, 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 on those issues. Uh, I think it's very difficult to really no, will that spread south? We know that uh, uh, Islamic State's modus operandi knows no borders, so uh, we cannot be complacent in this region. Uh, there has been real concerns for a long time that radicalism in South Africa as well, uh, that South Africa has been a kind of an incubator for that in some respects, a safe place for Islamists, uh, radical Islamists where they come for their R&R &R and these kinds of things. And you know, given the state of our own intelligence services, which have been under severe strain, uh, in South Africa, there is a broader concern that we may not have a good handle on this situation. And I think this also reflects in the thinking of some of the international intelligence agencies that we've seen over the years more broadly concerned about uh, the paucity and, and the uh, capacity uh, deficits in Southern Africa around intelligence and understanding these issues. Okay. Which leads me to, okay, I will stop there. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pierce. We will dig deeper into what the region um, uh, can do. But I would, uh, um, first of all, want to say as we're going to the, the second uh, segment that um, I want to thank all of you for your presentations. And I will now use this next segment to actually uh, field some questions and also take some questions from the audience. Um, to those who would like to contribute directly, please raise your hands in the Zoom app or write your comments in the chat section. And uh, we are also live streaming on the Open Parley uh, Facebook um, uh, page. That's Open Parley ZW Facebook page. Now, um, I would like to, first of all, take us back to the origins of this crisis. Uh, uh, all of you have touched a bit on that. And I want to hear from um, Adriano because News reports have said that most of this northern um, region has for years been forgotten by the audience uh, or, the, or the, the, the authorities. 
um, they are the forgotten people of Cabo Delgado. And as a result, the communities have relied predominantly on the teachings of Islamic uh, clerics in the mosques. And the government has only now become interested in the province following the discovery of um, on natural resources, according to reports, and some of you have, have touched on this. Alex says language matters. So why do people believe that ISIS is involved and not disgruntled locals? What would have sparked these kinds of insurgents, rebellions from the Islamic State? I know PS has mentioned a bit of this, but um, would like to know more about this. What evidence is there that it is um, ISIS that is involved in these attacks? Adriana? Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, indeed, uh, Kabbalah, which is a historic province, um, in the sense that it is in this province that um, Frelimu started the liberation struggle. And the dinosaurs of the liberation struggle, they are from there. It's also special because um, the first ever non Southerner president is from there. So um, uh, the current president, uh, President Nusi, is from Cabo Delgado, uh, is from a small um, ethnic group called the Maconte. They are the warriors. Um, but as part of the legacy of the liberation struggle, um, there are issues of ethnicity in this area. And um, there are sentiments that um, this group um, uh, might have alienated um, um, uh, a, a wider uh, community of Umwani who are the majority and they are Muslims. They are moderate Muslims. They have been there. They are merchants. They are business people, more in the coastal part uh, of Cap Delgado. And this is, um, it has been there for decades. The, uh, but there, there have been feelings that the more um, northerners, um, where the liberation struggle come from, they have been benefiting from um, the post-colonial Mozambique state vis-a-vis uh, uh, Dingwani, who are coastal, who, um, um, who are merchants um, and they're Muslims. And um, uh, in a sense, um, um, this might have led to um, uh, the, the, the really uh, um, um, uh, situation of Cap Delgado being a neglected uh, a province. It's a rich province, but neglected. It's rich on the one hand. It has alluvial um, mining activity. Uh, there's gold, which has attracted a considerable number of um, uh, African migrants to come to this. But this is all uh, illegal uh, artisanal mining. There is also illegal um, uh, logging, um, uh, small and big, that is taking place. Um, and so there is a lot of criminal economic activities uh, in this area. It is an important corridor um, of uh, drug trafficking um, from uh, one of the most uh, corrupt ports in Mozambique. It is the Pemba port, which uh, is used as um, a, a trafficking corridor of uh, um, uh, drugs, inclu including um, heroin to Maputo and all the way down uh, to South Africa. With all this happening, with all this happening, there was a, this huge discovery of uh, world-class gas reserves. This not only changed the attitudes of the elites in, this, in the South, in Maputo, as they quickly went borrowing, uh, and they were borrowing big, legal and illegally, believing that um, the gas down there would quickly be monetized and no one would notice this illegal borrowing because there would be super revenues to quickly pay back that. This is not the case, unfortunately, uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, this is super. Um, this, uh, um, uh, the idea that Mozambique is rich, it quickly changed the expectations of the people. 
believing that they would improve their livelihood in a relatively short period of time. And also the nature of the state is to be interrogated because the state, it has, um, it has changed from an absent state to a more um, uh, a comprador type of elitism uh, associating themselves with protecting the interests of uh, the international oil companies in terms of resettlement. So if you look at the resettlement, developments that were taking place. So um, people, um, they believed that um, in a relatively short period of time, with this happening, there would have been problems, but not of this magnitude. Then uh, two years ago, um, a huge and unexpected, no one saw it coming. But of course, the, uh, the radicalization um, of Islam with the youth and we have to uh, be honest here to say, um, we have been kind of following um, uh, that um, radicalization was taking place, particularly amongst the youth, who, which is the segment that felt the most the issue of relative marginalization, etc. But also from new leaders, um, religious leaders coming from other parts, not only of Africa, but of uh, uh, Middle East, etc., with a new ways of looking at Quran and interpreting Quran, etc. And these new leaders, they kind of felt that the old structures of Muslim were kind of uh, have sided with Frelimo. So uh, Frelimo is the former liberation movement that has been in power since independence. So they, they, they kind of uh, tried to fill that, that gap that was, uh, that was there. So all this has been happening and the attitude of the police, how the police reacted the most of the time, kind of beating up people, uh, jailing people, etc. The first attack, it happened in this context. Okay. So people believed that there were young, um, uh, uh, young people unhappy with the, with the police, dissatisfied with uh, the economic condition of exclusion, lack of development, etc. But um, we also saw signs of, um, of Islamism. We also uh, saw signs of radicalized and particularly um, the people who were um, uh, in the front lines of the attack using the, um, the flags of the Islamic State and targeting uh, state institutions, targeting um, the modern uh, signs of the state. And with time passage, they then started to exhibit messages claiming uh, that they wanted to implement a Sharia kind of state they wanted to implement. Though they used uh, local language, local dialects, but um, it, it, um, it was in a framework uh, and the language and the messaging, it was that of, um, uh, of Islamic State. So the point I'm making here is, there, there are huge grievances in Cabo Delgado related to um, an absent state, which over time it has seen as um, uh, siding uh, with um, uh, taking sides with international oil companies, and also these who are far, far absent from the realities of the communities. But there is also an element here of um, an Islamist um, insurgency that is taking place. So um, okay. to conclude, uh, uh, to I think we'll, we'll come. We'll, we'll come back. To, we will. Uh, we will come back to 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 to, to, to this point. I, I see we have so many uh, messages and uh, comments that are coming in, and um, in the interest of time, I will ask the panelists to keep your responses short, so we can get as many comments and questions um, from our viewers as possible, because they all want to hear um, your thoughts on what's been happening. In, in, in Mozambique and indeed, uh, um, you know, uh, the impact this will have in the region. So let me just go to um, one of the questions from Tinashe uh, Takuwa. Uh, he says, um, 
uh, and this is directed to Alex Magaisa, considering the nature of Zimbabwean economy where various elites have been accused of capturing the economy, do you see any possibility of influential people or companies volunteering to fund uh, the ZNA's intervention? Alex, you have to unmute. Right, I'm on now. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, Tinashe. Um, I was actually looking at the charts and seeing one question which I thought related to my topic, but I, I'll, I'll deal with that. Um, the, the economic situation is obviously uh, most troubling and most precarious for Zimbabwe. Uh, there is always in opportunities in, in situations like this, uh, people who wait in the wings to try and exploit the situation. We've already seen, uh, just to use the example of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that there's been a, a lot of corruption that has been taking place, uh, fueled and engineered by elites, uh, people who are connected to the very top of the government. And, and so uh, we also saw how the DRC war was exploited uh, by, by elites in the military and in, in the political uh, uh, structures. And so the possibility of elites taking advantage of any military deployment or any intervention in Mozambique is obviously very, very high. And this is why it's important for Zimbabweans to be vigilant in connection with how public resources and public funds are used because for many people, uh, they see this as an opportunity to help friends, but for others, they see this as an opportunity to help themselves. Would they be willing to step in to fund? Uh, they will only do so, of course, if there is a profit to be made from uh, any, any, any activities that they might uh, wish to engage in in that process. So uh, there is no free lunch and elites will always, will always take advantage of the situation whenever it presents itself. For my part, I, I think that uh, there is need for, for parliament, there is need for civil society, uh, there is need for the opposition uh, parties to be involved, to have a, a clear uh, 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 role in ensuring that whatever is done in the process of assisting a neighbor is done in the most transparent, is done in a way uh, that is accountable. And also, uh, still on that, um, um, uh, Alex, as much as Zimbabwe would like to help, um, some will say the economy is, um, and as you've also uh, pointed out, uh, doddering on total collapse and uh, internal political insecurity. It actually lacks this um, the requisite capacity, and it simply does not have the resources. And as you've talked about, uh, you know um, what happened in the DRC, and also uh, how the Zimbabwe economy collapsed um, when we engaged in um, in Mozambique against Renamo. Should the Zimbabwe state be concerned about trying to deploy hungry soldiers in a foreign country? Well. You know, uh, this is a, a, a huge challenge. Uh, those of us who have studied history uh, understand that empires, very big empires, have collapsed on the back of uh, disastrous military adventures. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, kings, uh, queens who were ambitious uh, spent a lot of money which they did not have. They borrowed money, they, they raised taxes, uh, which were which made people very unhappy, and uh, and so we are we are putting ourselves in a situation, of course, which uh, given our, the precariousness of our economy is going to to be very very difficult. There are many good reasons. Don't get me wrong. Many good reasons why we should be concerned with what's going on in Mozambique. There's uh, many good reasons why we should help uh, our neighbor because we are also helping ourselves. However we have to do so from a position uh, that takes into account that we are not even able to help ourselves at the moment economically. And, and so uh, the prospect that you raise, uh, I would rather call it the specter of uh, hungry soldiers being deployed into a foreign country, uh, their reaction, uh, I, I, cannot, I cannot even begin to imagine. 
how things might be in, in that situation. So it's an economic reality that has to be taken into account. And perhaps it is these economic challenges that have restrained the Zimbabwean government from uh, rushing in to intervene already. Uh, if we were in a better position, perhaps Zimbabwe would already have been involved in more ways than it currently is at the moment. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, Brian, uh, this is a question from uh, Martin Taruinga. Um, he asks, from the discussion so far, it appears that this is the first time that SADC is intervening in a military way. Has SADC actually engaged the African Union? If not, does the group believe they have enough capacity to deal with this threat or there are other factors? Brian? Brian, can you unmute your mic? Thank you. Sadak did intervene in Madagascar. I think that the point, we think the point being made is that uh, 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 the Sadak organ, as fully constituted, it would find its first real test in this particular one. Uh, I think a lot is made, and, and one understands uh, whether the use of the term Islamist group is an alibi meant to justify the use of external forces and therefore um, evade addressing the socio-economic structural crisis. I don't think it's an either-or. I think that when we look at uh, northern Nigeria, when we look at Somalia, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, portions of Libya, these issues don't exist in isolation. Excluded groups begin to construct narratives and bases of their exclusion, either as ethnicity, as race, as religion. They begin to construct failures within the state by reference to either its moral ethical failure, if they are elites, liberal democratic failure, but if they are faith groups, they begin to construct this on the basis of, as did Boko Haram, the influence of Western culture and so on and so forth. So I think we, we shouldn't be looking for single narratives to explain this. So would Sadak be able to handle this? They would. The complementarity and subsidiarity principles of the African Union essentially mean the following that uh, unless SADAC, and uh, until SADAC calls upon the African Union, uh, it is assumed that the regional economic community would lead the effort of the African Union. We have a very interesting situation where Cyril Ramaphosa is the chair of the African Union, right? And Nangagwa is the chair of the, I think, uh, uh, of the SADAC organ. So we have the influence of AU and SADC both in the region. In previous expeditions, how were these financed? There was external support, uh, which is self-interested support by under the so-called war on terror. But there was also countries found ways, and this was the Congolese scandal, of getting the host country to pay using natural resources prospective payments. Hence, the question around the looting of the Congo arises. And for countries like Zimbabwe, you would not totally put it past them that they, are asking, they would be asking the Mozambicans, well, we owe you money for electricity. We will provide security on the basis that this is an exchange for continued provision of electricity. It is my hope, though, that they will go to the central funding port that for once other countries will realize the importance of financing uh, the organ. Yes, there may be need for development partner support, but this will focus on that security component, the, the military component. We all know, having worked in uh, security, the following. No military solution, no military solution has ever existed to a problem of uh, radicalization. None. So as uh, peers and others have said, you would therefore need a cocktail of interventions that target, number one, the socio-economic crisis and 
premise of the discontent. But let me caution uh, colleagues here that it does not necessarily follow that if you do development, uh, insurgency will end because the multidimensionality of insurgent, it's spiritual, it's sociocultural, it's economic, it's political dimensions, are such that it has enablers within the state, right? Enablers where either politicians, uh, military folk, who see the dividends of instability or who see the power dividend in the instability, in the sense that their power and influence in the state is greater because they will, it will always be military, which they may control, that will have be required to deal with the problem as characterized. So it seems to me that as we continue with this dialogue, Violet, it's useful that we think beyond the narrow liberal con uh, conception, because I've, I've been working on and around the issues of the Great Lakes, uh, Somalia now, uh, uh, if you like, the <laughs> Sahel, uh, and a little bit of the Lake Chad Basin going up to, I have not seen anywhere where the development fix, which is actually a very terrible assumption, that the only reason why insurgency arises is poverty. You no. Know? If you look at the biography of insurgents from Somalia to Northern Nigeria, it will include the very poor, but it will also include members of the middle class whose affinity to the, to the grievance may have less to do with their economic status, but more with a political position, ideological position, or a constructed religious position. The dialogue should not be confined to dialogue with uh, imams, and Muslimic, Islamic leadership. Because the assumption that the Islamic leadership in the territory or area is, the, is responsible for or has influence over the Islamists is wrong. That's what Libya tells us. The Imams have no influence. That's what Mali is telling us. That at some stage, the external dimensions, financing and enabling of uh, jihadist groups has, is totally disconnected from the reality of local religious orders. So on, on that note, let me actually go to a question from um, a Fashion Mawere, who's asking, would the Islamist narrative or framing of the crisis be one scapegoat that can be used uh, by the state to source external military intervention instead of dealing with the grievances of isolation and, and the marginalization of northerners? Pierce, can you respond to this? Uh, hi, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'll try and speak. I'm, I'm in a car with uh, uh, with a small baby who may start to talk. But yes, this particular issue uh, is 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 correct. I mean, we 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 see the scapegoating uh, uh, not just in 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 this scenario, but so we saw President Nusi turning and pointing at external uh, factors and external influence. Piers, you're breaking uh, up. And uh, uh, without making any acknowledgement of the internal domestic push and pull factors uh, that are in play here that we've heard from. Uh, Violet, hello. Sorry, you were breaking up a bit there. Hey, I'm, not, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the, the depths of the free state where there may, may be. Uh, uh, not great coverage. Uh, I was just saying that this issue is, a, is, is of concern, and I would agree with Brian Kagora that it's not about either or, or, but we have seen the president of Mozambique and the uh, defense and police uh, chiefs uh, and the political uh, heads of those, uh, uh, of those institutions pointing at external elements and not making reference uh, to the domestic uh, push and pull factors. Oh, P.S. I'm afraid we we we're losing you. We'll we'll try to get back to you again. Let me let me go to um uh, 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 uh professor in 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 Mozambique. There, um, let's go back to the issue of what the continent, the AU or SADC, uh, can do. Um, has the 
AU Continental Early Warning System been um, activated uh, to draw attention of the AU to the serious challenge that has the potential to affect the security and also the economic um, development of the continent? Prof? Uh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Well, I think the first uh, an issue. Uh, hello, Pierce. Are you back? No, we've lost him again. Sorry, Prof. You can you can continue. Thank you so much. So, um, uh, one uh, Mozambique um, will uh, take over SADC leadership uh, next September. So we expect to see. Um, um, more uh, positive developments uh, from SADC, uh, considering, um, however, that uh, SADC has no experience of intervening um, uh, in countries that need. Um, uh, they have failed to intervene in Madagascar, um, uh, but we uh, are still hoping that um, uh, countries like Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa, um, they can use the framework of SADC um, to, uh, to bail Mozambique in this situation. Uh, that is important. So we are not saying um, that um, Zimbabwe uh, um, um, should come uh, in a bilateral, um, but it, it should be in the context of um, in the context of SADC and, and building on existing relationships between the two countries and, and the interests um, uh, of the two countries and also building um, on the relationship with uh, South Africa. So these two countries, Zimbabwe and South Africa, we are talking of SADC, but we are looking at these two countries also Angola, uh, because of the historic relationships um, with Mozambique. On, on, on the African Union, it is really disappointing um, uh, to me what is happening with, uh, with the African Union. We have been giving a lot of information to the African Union um, to look at what is happening in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. uh, President, um, uh, uh, President Nusi, has said, and I think he was, uh, he was correct in, in, in saying, listen, uh, initially, Mozam, um, the situation in northern Mozambique, um, it, it looked to be, it looked like a domestic issue. And um, the defense, the Minister of Interior, um, three weeks ago, he was in Parliament, and he said, Cabo um, Delgado, um, it is, um, um, significantly a domestic issue, but um, there is a regional and international dimension. When it comes to um, uh, um, Islamist um, kind of um, um, uh, uh, armed groups, let me frame it this way, as an um, Islamist armed group that is active in northern Mozambique, um, this is beyond uh, Mozambique's capacity to deal with. And uh, the more we spend and waste time in the issues of framing the such uh, uh, prof, we, we, prof Navita, we, we, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. We, we, we can't hear you. Uh, while we're sorting out your connection, um, let me go. I see we have a couple of raised hands. Uh, one is from Pearl Matibe, who is in Washington, D.C. Uh, Pearl, are you there? Can you please put your video and your mic on so you can, we can, you can get your yes. contribution? I'm here. Thank you very much, uh, Violet. Um, I appreciate very much the opportunity uh, and the fact that we are discussing Mozambique. Uh, this is a very, very um, significant, complex, and highly challenging topic, and I'm glad we've got so many people here. I just want to quickly um, uh, allude to what some of the uh, panelists have shared, and then uh, come to my question in terms of um, the aspect uh, from the 
perspective of the United States government, and then come to my uh, question regarding possible solutions for Mozambique uh, with ramifications for Zimbabwe. So um, what Brian said is uh, absolutely uh, important. I think the, the biggest player here in terms of countries is going to be the United States um, because they've got um, the big uh, LNG companies, uh, ExxonMobil um, and, uh, and, and Riaco. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what um, Adriano talked about, and this is regarding Islam. The notion that Islam in Muslims is, a, is something new, something that maybe was even there during the uh, liberation war with Frelimo, um, is incorrect. Um, Adriano was correct to allude to um, what is happening there. Um, I do have a number of people on my team who are in the thick of things right at the heart of the Cabo Delgado crisis. Um, and so we are monitoring and talking to them uh, almost many hours throughout the day. Um, each one of them views Zimbabwe and SADC as where military help will come from and not from um, the DIC advisory group, DAG, which is the private military company uh, stationed there right now. So in terms of Islam, Islam in Cabo Delgado started way back, it's been, it's been there for centuries. It began in the 8th and 9th century. And so when time came when the Portuguese were leaving Mozambique, and uh, Mozambique was having its independence, and we had Frelima and so on come in, there's been a, uh, a tension uh, between the uh, Islamic uh, groups in, um, in, in Cabo Delgado and the Mozambican government, and indeed Frelimo. Those, that is something that must and absolutely has to be dealt with between, uh, by the Mozambican government, otherwise they will never have a clear path to coming to this um, solution. But uh, I want to just mention that uh, I have been pressing the United States government time and time again on uh, what they might do in terms of assisting. Uh, they do give a lot of money and support to the government on, of Mozambique. In fact, last month, I asked Ambassador Thibault Pinage, who is the Assistant Secretary Bureau of African Affairs in the, in the State Department, to share a little bit about the challenges of the insurgency in Northern Mozambique. And he said, and I'm gonna quote, he said, the embassy, their embassy, And to the U.S. government, they see the SADC as being the primary regional bloc that needs to be dealing with this. In terms of what Adriano said, yes, SADC is coming up with, an, uh, with a new meeting, uh, with a regular meeting in August. And uh, Emerson Mnangagwa, uh, president of Zimbabwe, will not be the chair in a few months. It'll be um, Masisi from Botswana is the, next per, is the next country to take over that chairmanship. But so what we've been seeing over the last few days, and I said to you, I do have a team of people who are physically on the ground in Cabo, <coughs> excuse me, in Cabo Delgado. Um, this year alone, and Piers alluded to this, that the very first attack was actually on October the 5th on 2017. And since we've seen about 400 attacks, which is what Piers was talking about, but just this year alone, in 2020 alone, there's been more than 100 attacks Okay, um, just last Thursday, uh, six children had to be taken to the hospital because they were hit by shrapnel, which I believe the private military company DAG was involved with. So the question here is, um, it's not just about having a military option in, in terms of solving this uh, uh, is, uh, Islamic um, insurgency. They are becoming more technologically uh, 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 successful. They use drones. They um, infiltrate the civilian population. They blend in. They are doing multiple concurrent simultaneous attacks on multiple cities. Just last Thursday, they were in Mokamiya and they were in Chai at the same time. Um, some, one day, they were playing football with the local residents, and then uh, they, were they were able to leave the town way before the Mozambican soldiers came in. So I think one of the things that needs to happen is more than just military action. There has to be some way to satisfy what the 
uh, Muslims have not been given for decades and decades that dates back to when the Portuguese were ruling Mozambique. Right now, when you see Toto and Riaco and, um, and, and ExxonMobil come in, they feel that those lands that were owed by their, you, you know, in African culture, when we have got our lands, our rural lands, we're tied to those lands through our familial and Kenyan kinship ties. They feel that these things are being taken away from them. There is high unemployment. The, the root of the problem here is they have been so marginalized, the, the insurgency groups, and so now they're becoming so brutal, so um, barbaric in their attacks. They're not just burning private and public infrastructure, they're burning people. They're burning bodies. We're finding just last week bodies burnt in the backs of trucks. So yeah. the, the solution has to be more about more than just military. We have to find ways to engage them, to engage the local leaders and the people, because the victims of the civilians, they've been caught in the middle there. 29,000 people in Makomia were fleeing last week to go to Pemba, which is the capital city of the district. And, 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 and uh, WFP has closed up their offices. I was actually yesterday, I was speaking to uh, one of the senior US um, officials in uh, USAID, which is a humanitarian um, organization that provides help to, to, to Mozambique. And I asked him to, to, to spell out what are they going to do to help the insurgency. And he said that um, they are, uh, he, this, I was talking to Christopher Ruyan. Okay, Paul, the, you, 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 you just have to I'm going yeah, to close. Because we, 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 there's so many people who also want to, 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 to contribute. Yep. So, so my point is really that uh, the solution is not just military. We have to go and satisfy the basic needs of the uh, Islamic community and include them in the ruling of in the in the running of the country. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Let me before I go to the uh, next question from, um, from 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 one of our viewers. I'd like to hear from from Alex because. Um, you know, I think it was Brian who said some time before about African solutions to African problems. Um, so Alex, is this the time to enlist the help of countries with superior security intelligence and uh, technology to track down and dismantle the network of terrorists? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, Paul also mentioned the issue of um, US uh, intervention. Your mic, uh, Alex. But some of us are not technologically minded, so we forget. Um, but thank you very much, uh, uh, Violet. Um, you know, it, it, it's always very difficult when you are in a crisis to uh, formulate a sober and, uh, and uh, um, you know, comprehensive way of dealing with the, with the crisis. Um, you, you tend to... to be all over the place. But I think that we must look internally. Uh, as, as Brian has said, I was reading some of his comments in the chat. The problem is not a problem of capacity. The, the Zimbabwean army, you know, it, it has its, its weaknesses, but it, it, is, it is a very strong army as an institution. It has, it has done a, a quite a lot of peacekeeping missions. It has been involved in, in various missions and has, has done uh, pretty well where it has been. Um, the, the Angolan army is, is another. You know, these are armies that intervened in the DRC. They, they did what they did. They have a lot more experience, perhaps, than even the armies that are more, uh, well, that are well endowed in terms of resources. So, so it's not about capacity. Capacity is there, but, but you know, we, we don't have uh, resources in terms of being able to finance uh, for example, a, a, a deployment. Um, and, and even if you talk about the intelligence and so forth, it's also not a, a necessarily a question uh, of, of lacking capacity to be able to find intelligence, to share information. Indeed, even the superior powers, they do rely on the local and the domestic in order to, to find the things that they need. Um, so, you know, if Africa were more organized i think if we were more organized and more ready to take on the responsibilities uh, that we have we would not need to 
be looking around for uh, attention and for assistance from outside. Because as I say, there, there is never free lunch. There is never uh, assistance that is given uh, uh, for free. There is always a price that you have to pay for that. Now, what has to be assessed is the nature of the crisis in Cabo Delgado. We've already heard that there are mercenary armies which have been used in that region in order to counter the problems. And the Mozambican government presumably has been paying, or at least it has been paying for some of that. Um, but obviously it hasn't worked, and, and which is why the crisis has, has escalated. Uh, we must also be very careful to, to note that even the, the very rich countries of this world, they have intervened, they have histories of intervention in other countries. And those interventions have, always, have not always uh, resulted in full and lasting solutions to those communities. So we have to be very careful how we start uh, making calls for invitations and, and so forth. In my opinion, I think it is important for the countries within the region to get together as they are doing, I think the, the Troika, the organ uh, meeting was, was an important one in this regard, uh, but it is important for them to really get together and see how best they can use the capacity that they have. Of course, it is always important, it's useful to, to you cannot refuse assistance if it is offered, but it has to be assistance that the countries within the African region are able to control, uh, assistance that you know, does not take away control from their hands. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Alex. And I understand we have uh, colleagues from Mozambique who want to contribute. Uh, one of them is um, Martino. Is Martin, Martin, Martino still on online? I think we've just lost him. Let me go to Happy Mo Chaira, who's also raised his hand. Happy Mo? Oh, yes. Uh, good evening. Hi, Happy Mo. You, you can go ahead. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, panel. And I've just been uh, going uh, through the SADAC website, and I happened to notice that uh, there is uh, some form of uh, a standby force or a SADAC uh, a brigade that was formed some time around in uh, August uh, 2008. So I'm asking, uh, what is the viability of uh, this organ in terms of uh, uh, the intervention? Because it seems to say they are supposed to be an African standby force, uh, which is supposed to be in each African region and should be ready for rapid deployment anywhere in Africa uh, at inappropriate uh, uh, time. So I wanted to ask, what are these the, the necessary steps that are being taken by, by the, con uh, the convergence of the SADAC Troika in, in order to uh, activate this uh, force. Uh, Piers, can you take that question? I think we still lost uh, Piers. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I mean, the, I've already tried in the chat to answer in the questions. There is an Africa standby force. The AU has deployed uh, uh, in Somalia. The AU was present in Central Africa Republic. The AU was present in portions of Mali. Uh, the challenge with the standby force is really the, the peace fund needs to be replenished. So that's why I said in the chat that the issue is not uh, capacity of African standby force or even the SADAC standby force to intervene. It is, this is not a, a one day intervention to solve an electoral dispute. This is a long haul, long term. And as I've already said, a cocktail of, um, of, in, of interventions is required. You cannot, find, you cannot have a military solution to insurgency of the nature that we're seeing in Northern Mo Mozambique because the insurgents not only have a political ideology, a faith, 
claim, an economic agenda, and a complex political objective. I mean, if they are ISIS, as uh, we are led to believe, then the, the, their objective is to establish a caliphate. A caliphate is the equivalent of an empire or a, queen, a kingdom. You are not going to assuage them by simply making sure that they have uh, canned beef and beans and whatever it is that uh, development agencies hand out. So that essentially means that when you are looking at that part of the country, you have to look at more. With respect to the AU, let me explain something. And, and I know that especially Zimbabweans and Southern Africans are, are always frustrated by the AU. And there are many reasons to be frustrated by the AU. But there is a principle, principles we call of subsidiarity and complementarity. It's a long established protocol. Unless, number one, a member state that's facing a threat requests for intervention and assistance, there will not be intervention and assistance. It's assumed the member state has the capacity uh, to address uh, the local challenge that it faces. Number two, unless the regional bloc in which a member state facing a challenge requests assistance from the rest of the union, the union will defer to that regional bloc. Now, now here is the difference. The question is whether we must have a relook at the entire AU intervention matrix and distinguish between general armed conflict and uh, radical uh, uh, violent extremism. In the sense, as I said in the chat, the people who we call violent extremists and Perla has referred to their complexity are deeply embedded in society. That embeddedness essentially means they are not early fighters coming to destabilize the peace of the community. They are an integral part, and Sadak has dealt with guerrilla warfare and knows it. So I would say that you do need an AU, a Sadak intervention, but you need above all else, you need a Mozambican government intervention that doesn't deal with violent extremism as a disease that must be eradicated but that deals with it in its developmental, in its political and ideological context. And that means a lot more work than simply hiring private military companies or dropping a few bombs or getting more superior drones because the underlying grievance will not go, but the, as you know, violent extremists are willing to die. They commit to die for the cause. So they are not necessarily soldiers of fortune they leave in a moment and if so the the program should not just be to mitigate and to stop it will be how do you reintegrate them into societies where they have created committed atrocities and ensure that they are not stigmatized i mean there's a whole strategy beyond military that we all need to be discussing but first we must stop the spread why must we stop the spread the number of unemployed and disenchanted young people in Malawi, in Tanzania, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, and all the neighboring countries around Mozambique is high. The likelihood of whatever foreign enabler that's giving them weapons, uh, Violet, the one thing that people are avoiding saying, so let's assume you were correct that the characterization of this as an Islamic fundamentalist group is just an alibi. I am hard pressed to understand where is the money to buy guns? Yes, there are guns taken from the army, but it costs a lot of money to buy one small handgun. Where is the money to buy the drones? It's coming from somewhere. If we don't follow the money, we will be in a military expedition for the next 20 years. To stop this, you have to stop the flow of the money. And the flow of the money is not coming from local businessmen because they don't have enough to buy the sort of weaponry that we're seeing in northern Mozambique. And that's why I said locate it in its geoeconomic and geopolitical context, but address its local structural uh, fundamentals, which are socioeconomic, uh, political exclusion, uh, marginalization by the state, stigmatization, and so on and so forth. But don't ignore the international dimensions. Thanks for that, uh, Brian. And um, I understand we have um, the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations, uh, a U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee member online who would also like to make a contribution. 
Is it TJ or JT? Hi, it's uh, it's JT. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a professional staff member leading Africa policy for Chairman Rich. I can tell you that um, the committee has been uh, deeply involved in uh, working uh, uh, working uh, to monitor the situation in Cabo Delgado. Uh, the chairman took a trip there uh, in August, and we continue to push for the U.S. government to ramp up its activities in the region. Um, I agree with many of the speakers here. This is not an, uh, an, an aid approach that's needed. Um, the, the ambassador has put together a three-pronged sort of, uh, you know, sort of diplomacy uh, development and, and, and defense strategy. Um, there has been some slow movement in terms of uh, U.S. military assistance. Uh, part of that is linked to the U.S., but a lot of it is linked to the Mozambican government. And what we continue to find is that we're really dealing with uh, a varsity problem with a junior varsity team. Uh, the president has yet to, uh, you know, appoint a single point of contact uh, in which other governments can engage in terms of this wider problem. Um, and military and military assistance has just been uh, challenged from the get-go. Uh, so it's something that we're looking at very closely. Um, this is a, a wonderful discussion, a great, a great panel, and uh, just know that uh, you know we, on our end, if, if you, you think that there's something that could be helpful in terms of prodding the U.S. government on, um, we're always willing to and ready to listen. Thank you very much for that. So let me go to Alex. Um, I, I'm still, by the way, trying to to get Adriana because there are quite a few. Uh, questions uh, from the floor, you, you know, for him, even some people want to know uh, how the situation has affected tourism in Mozambique. So as soon as he's back, we'll bring him, we'll, we'll bring him online. Alex, still on the issue of um, international intervention, we did talk a bit about uh, China and um, I just wanted to find out if you um, can share your thoughts on, uh, on, on, on this issue. We know that China has a close relationship with the Zimbabwean state uh, or certain elements of the Zimbabwean government. What is the Chinese role in the Mozambican conflict, would you know? And will it affect Zimbabwe's relationship with China? Uh, thanks, Violet. Um, to be honest, the probably the three other panelists um, are probably more in tune with uh, the sort of the geopolitical uh, interests and the relationships, uh, ongoing relationships in, in Mozambique. Um, so, so I would defer to, to Brian or Piers or, or Adriano, they probably would have a, a better and more nuanced uh, response to, to that question. I should however point out uh, my perspective that perhaps something that is going through the minds of many people who are in this uh, discussion listening in uh, and many others who are not on, on in, in this discussion, which is there, is there is something that seems to crop up within the African continent uh, that whenever a, a, an area or a region it discovers something that is uh, quite valuable, uh, be it oil, gas, diamonds, gold, or whatever uh, natural resource. It, it seems to to be followed by some kind of conflict. Uh, the the term that is often used uh, is is resource curse. And uh, now uh, I am not qualified to to discuss this in connection to what is going on. In, in northern Mozambique, in what is going on in Cabo Delgado. Uh, but you know, I would put it as a, as a question to my fellow panelists uh, to say, we have seen this in many other parts of Africa, uh, be it the DRC, Sierra Leone, uh, many other countries, uh, we, we have had situations of conflict whenever uh, important and invaluable resources are, are found. Yes, there are many other issues that have been raised in this conflict uh, concerning northern Mozambique, concerning Cabo Delgado. But, but what is the connection uh, to the wider interests that we then see and all the different players uh, that we then see uh, within that, that region? I think that we need to zero in 
on that issue. Uh, and this is why uh, I agree with the argument that has been put forward by fellow panelists that uh, this is not just a military problem. This is not just something that requires a military solution. Uh, the challenge is multifaceted and, and therefore the response must also be multifaceted. But, but I would like them to zero in on this issue of resources and uh, the connection to the conflict. Brian? You know, I, I, you know the, 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 the Alex, you are very right. We used to call it the resource curse, but that's an inappropriate uh, term because many other regions of the world, including China and the US, have phenomenal amounts of resources that somehow don't lead to these atomic fights within community. The choreographing of, uh, if you like, instability is linked to three factors. One, the financialization of natural resource extraction. Uh, number two, the militarization of the mineral economy uh, within our region. The very fact that the minerals, military. And this has gone on for some time. Number three, the very fact that the institutions we have set up for democratic control, such as parliaments and courts, have no jurisdiction over this aspect of our lives. Essentially means that people will choreograph uh, a measure of nationalism around resources where in essence and in actual effect, I'm yet to see local communities. From my work in Sierra Leone, uh, the work in Ghana, in Nigeria, very, in Niger Delta, in the Great Lakes region. I'm yet to see local communities which have developed to the levels that we're seeing in Dubai, levels that we're seeing in the Middle East as a result of their resources. Right? There were attempts by Gaddafi in taking money, some of that money giving back to communities. But by and large, the extraction is either done by multinational corporations that leave trinkets on the ground, pay very little royalties or taxation, or by military elites that bank the money externally. So the extraction is militarized. It's not patriotic. It is not developmental. But in order to keep the people from asking the fundamental questions, that you are destroying our environment, taking our resources, and we are not seeing any benefit, what essentially is done is to create uh, these fights over resources, mostly amongst the poor. And the Northern Mozambique question must not be mischaracterized at various levels. It has ethnic dimensions, it has religious dimensions, but it also has international dimensions. Where, how does money get to the insurgents? Does some of that money flow through the weak systems in Zimbabwe, in Malawi? How does that money nourish networks of political elites and other elites? And how might they harvest or have a bumper harvest from the conflict in Mozambique? And in essence, what that means is a solidarity is required, a solidarity of Zimbabwean and Mozambican peoples business, civil society, and faith. That says the spread of this type of violent extremism is going to be enabled by the inability for us as a collective to say, we demand that they be interventions that are holistic in Northern Mozambique, and we demand that the solutions are not purely military. Because once they are purely military violent and colleagues, they disable the role of parliaments and so-called institutions of democratic oversight. They disable the function of ordinary media folk because to report in that context, you risk violating state security laws. They disable the usual disclosure of information that enables a multi-pronged intervention economic diplomacy, social diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, uh, and so on and so forth. And so my sense is where we sit, the resource curse is a construct. It's a construct and an outcome of not only 
opaque, non-transparent, and unaccountable governance. It's a construct of greed. It's a construct of abuse of power. So the constitutionalism that you were talking about, Alex, earlier on, is key. But lastly, this is the point I've been making, Violet. I have for long tried to disabuse fellow Africans from the notion that if you sit with the nature and level of wealth, natural wealth, in hydrocarbons, in gold, we haven't even talked about uh, cashew nuts and forests and fish that is being taken almost willy-nilly off the coast of Mozambique. Foreign interests don't simply come to aid you out of your foolishness or into your development. They come to deal with and to address their own strategic interests. There are countries that are coming to Mozambique to set up industries that will help support the extraction when it starts. There are countries that are coming to grab land to establish hotels and factories in anticipation of the boom that will happen post 2030. Long-term planning. It seems to me, Alex, the curse is finally a problem of short-termism in approaching African development and resource extraction. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you very much for those insights, uh, Brian. Alex, uh, uh, let me come to you. Um, a brief comment uh, from you, and then I'll go to Pascal Holliger. Um, Alex, there was a, a question earlier on for you uh, from Bado um, asking, has the deployment or intended deployment been brought before uh, the Zimbabwean parliament? And also, can you just uh, respond to some of the issues that Brian has said? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the, the question by Badu, I'll probably answer it together with the question by my sister Shinga Inyoka. I thought I saw her say something asking a question which I wanted to respond to earlier because it's, it's about the oh, same. Oh, I missed, I missed Shinga Inyoka's, yeah. Yeah, yeah yes, I, think, I think it's about the same question with, with what uh, Badu is asking. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, is there any difference uh, between the constitution? Uh, when, when, when we intervened in the DRC and the Constitution now. Uh, so the, the Constitution now, what it has done, or at least uh, my memory of what we were trying to do seven years ago, was to uh, try and uh, re, re include um, Violet, I'm not sure whether we are still together. Yes. Okay, good, good. Something had happened there. <laughs> um, so um, I, was, I was saying the, the Constitution now is quite clear on what must be done in relation to the relationship between the President and Parliament. The idea was to create some checks and balances in how the President uses the power of deploying armed soldiers into wars, either internally or externally. And that is why section 213 and section 214 require the president to ensure that when he deploys defense forces, then parliament is uh, promptly uh, advised. And when it is advised, uh, it is also given the reasons for why the deployment has taken place. Now, the problem that we have is that uh, we have had uh, some deployments within Zimbabwe over the past uh, two years, three years, since the, the new uh, government of Mr. Mnangagwa came into power. And unfortunately, on all those occasions, uh, there was no compliance with these provisions until very much late. And it happened only because people were uh, sniping and raising questions about the need to account in terms of the constitution. So, um, Parliament was told, but it was told much, much later. So you could say that there was actually a violation of the constitution. Now, in relation to the crisis in Mozambique, has there been any information given to Parliament? Well, when this issue arose, I think probably about three or four weeks ago, there was information which suggested that Zimbabwe had already deployed troops in Mozambique. The government then denied that it had uh, done so. Uh, but, but I remember writing a note and indicating 
what needed to be done. And I was essentially uh, giving an account of what our constitution says needs to be done. As far as I'm aware, at the moment, the government's official position is that they have not deployed any soldiers uh, to Mozambique, and therefore there is no need to inform parliament. But I hope that when that time comes, if that does happen, uh, the government will do the decent thing and uh, inform parliament and give reasons why it is going into Mozambique. It is the right thing to do, even though we all know, or perhaps we now understand that there is indeed a crisis in Mozambique. The related issue is of course the financing of the war, because then uh, Zimbabwe will have to find resources from somewhere in order to be able to finance the deployment. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is a question for Minister Muduri <laughs> Ngure. Uh, and we all know the challenge that we are facing uh, on that front. Uh, I don't think I need to belabor the point. Definitely. And before we uh, get final words from uh, the panelists, let me go to Pascal Holliger, who's had uh, his hand raised for some time now. Pascal? Uh, thank, thank you, Violet. Uh, and thanks to all the panelists uh, for their insightful contributions. I, I want to make a brief uh, intervention because uh, I'm, I'm with the Swiss Embassy in, in Harare. Um, I was before posted to Nigeria and have quite uh, an intimate uh, knowledge of, of the insurgency in the northeast Nigeria, Lake Chad, Boko Haram. And what strikes me here is the, the similarity of the patterns um, with, you know, between what happened in, in Nigeria and what is happening in, in northern Mozambique, both from the government side, but also from the, uh, the insurgency side. So initially, uh, a, a denial. Uh, nothing is going on. Nothing is happening. Don't worry about it. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, a complete lack of action. Pascal, uh, why are you hiding your face? Pascal, can you just move, move, move your, your monitor down so we can see you? You know, Bri Brian has, has <laughs> li likes to see my face. I don't know why. <laughs> he, he, there we go. I'm not properly dressed. That's why maybe I was hiding. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so, so after that, you get, you get uh, private military contractors uh, in. Um, and then you, you, know, you bring in the uh, international jihadi dimension and so on and so forth. But you, all the while, you don't address the fundamental issues that the underlying causes that, that, you know, that, that uh, fuel these, uh, these insurgencies. Uh, the methods of the insurgents, also similar evolution in terms of, uh, of violence, methodologies, communication. Now, I think there would be a lot of value to do uh, comparative analysis of what was, you know, what, what, how, how the insurgencies developed in, in the late Chad in Somalia and what the responses were and really try to avoid some of the same mistakes in, in, in the response. I think one of the troubling issues is that uh, the response to these types of insurgencies by the states has been chronically bad and, and the conflicts have been chronically mismanaged. And this management has only served one, one, you know, one cause, and that was to further fuel uh, the, the violence and, and get it into uh, an animal that one loses control over. Um, the other thing that is important to consider is if there's going to be intervention, it is critically important that the interventions are not going to make things worse. What we've seen in a lot of contexts is that when the army is deployed, uh, the abuses that are meted out on both the insurgents, but then also indiscriminately on civilians, just serve to further again incite and, and, and fuel the insurgency. In Nigeria, there was a time when the actions of the military were probably the number one recruitment factor for, for the Boko Haram uh, insurgency. And so that disconnect um, between uh, local communities and their government needs to be bridged. It cannot be that every time the state gets involved, uh, becomes visible in, in these communities, it is always in, in a negative way. And so that's where I agree with Brian that the intervention 
uh, has to be first and foremost a Mozambique intervention, a multi-dimensional intervention. And Mozambique has to do things in Cabo Delgado, for Cabo Delgado, that maybe it has never done before. And that's, that's the difficulty, is to uh, react intelligently, react in a subtle way, and do things that perhaps you have not done before, and that's why the situation is, uh, is, is, is what it is now. The last thing I wanted to say is, uh, two last things. The first one is, if there is regional intervention, of course it can be maybe a short-term option to reduce the pressure on, the Mozambi on, 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 on Mozambique or to assist. It can have some preventive uh, capacity, but one needs to calibrate it very carefully in a way that it does not lead to internationalization of the conflict. Because the minute you have armies from neighboring countries uh, that come in, that can also trigger, if it is again mis mismanaged, responses that could then uh, regionalize the, the, the conflict. And with the weakness of the neighboring states, Malawi and this, this area, which is, which is pretty remote, it will be very easy for, for these uh, insurgents to, to move around and, 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 and hit in the asymmetric warfare. The last point is that we should, not have, uh, we should avoid the taboo of dialogue. There is always this thing that you cannot talk to insurgents, to Islamic insurgents, you will legitimize them, you will give them credence and so on and so forth. Uh, if it is not too late, let us not avoid the, 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 the option of, of dialogue, of direct engagement with them. It has worked to an extent in some circumstances. It should be one of the tools in the toolbox and not, uh, and not, uh, and, and not denied. So that's my brief contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal, for that. Uh, Brian and, um, and Alex, I'll come back to you for your final remarks, but I see we have uh, two more hands uh, raised and it will be nice to hear um, from, from some women. So Peter Thonycroft, Peter, you'll have to unmute your mic. We cannot hear you. Your mic is still muted, Peter. Okay. Uh, okay. Is that okay? Yes. Now we can hear you. Oh, thank God. I'm I'm absolutely useless at this. <laughs> um, I had I didn't hear some of you guys at the beginning because I was late joining. But I'm I've been watching yeah. this quite carefully and I'm trying to hope hopefully to report it quite soon. Um, I I I started off after a couple of years of receiving WhatsApps. What? pictures um, of, of Islamists allegedly in Mozambique. I was receiving two or three a week for a couple of years. And um, we also couldn't sell this story. People were not interested in it. And they're more interested in it now. And suddenly that supply of, um, of pictures has stopped. And so if one speaks to people in around Pemba, and you know, even further north, um, it seems to me that the um, military group that was the military group, the security group that was brought in, you know, in, in early in April, has considerably um, squashed quite a lot of the activity, the, the activity that was going on. And the more that I hear about it, the more I wonder if this is. An Islamist group. Um, there certainly is a lot of poverty there. Of course, it's been a, you know, it's been a Muslim area up, up that coastline for you know a century or more. And so I am no longer sure that the claims of being an Islamist group that we hear about is not actually just a poster, a kind of a poster that emerged externally subsequent to a couple of the spectacular um, hits that the group had when it took the northernmost port and then it attacked, you know, the capital of Cabo Delgado. And of course, the enormous change in social situations that the exploration for gas and the construction around that peninsula very close to where the gas is going to be extracted from, whether or not that hasn't affected uh, communities in that area and, and we know very little about them and of course their relationship also 
in trading with hardwoods, etc., with the Tanzanians across the border. It's the sea trade that's been going on for centuries. So we know very little about this. And I, I, I must say, it's absolutely fascinating finding out about the life up there. But I, uh, 10 days ago, I would have said, yes, obviously these are Islamists. I'm not so sure about that now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. And uh, last uh, person is NPP. Please, can you make it short? Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Nayanka Ferdinand, and I'm at the African Leadership Centre at King's College London. Um, so I wanted to just um, say that um, the contributions were really, really good. Um, but um, what I wanted to say is that it looks like we're dealing with a very complex and complicated situation um, that I would like to um, be seen or understood in the very particular context that Cabo Delgado has always found itself. So there's a path of dependency and continuity from the very way that the state and society uh, have been disconnected. So the absence of that state reflects a real lack of a leadership process or a holistic leadership process that over time has allowed um, external actors um, and non-state actors to emerge and to actually provide that kind of leadership for a particular community in Cabo Delgado that has been neglected for many, many years. And this is being seen as well in other parts of the continent. For example, even in um, Guinea-Bissau, we've seen that there are Islamist pockets emerging, providing for that community in exchange for many different things. Um, so I just wanted to add that as we are talking about uh, the ramifications of intervening and finding solutions that we really must take into account. And I agree with what Brian said, that the government, the solution that comes from that government in, in that maybe for the very first time, it has to find a way to mutually connect and engage with that uh, population and that community in that area, something that it has not done before. Um, and that is very, very important before we start thinking about a military approach to that solution. Um, and also, uh, also thinking about external actors intervening. We have to really think, how can that society also um, speak up and, and let us know um, what it's been facing over the years? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And so, uh, Brian and, and, and Alex, in your closing, closing remarks, uh, especially Brian, um, can you start, uh, can you also respond to Patience Chiradza, who says that um, uh, we need to look also at the impact on vulnerable groups, especially women and children. If the insurgents are within the community, what is the role of women? and goals so they can be interventions that are um, uh, appropriate. And um, various other people have also said the same thing, that uh, it'll be really nice to um, also look at uh, the opportunities for providing support and assistance to these women. So Brian, in your closing remarks, can you also say a bit about that? Yeah, um, I think if you go back, thanks Nyanka for for that, uh, I think, opposite uh, characterization. Uh, when we think about uh, radicalism, when we think about uh, violent extremism, it's mm. useful that we don't, we, we keep in mind, I think my point mm. is about the leadership role, leadership role. Yeah. Uh, leadership by the state, the absence by the state and leadership that's now offered by informal actors and informal uh, processes. Uh, so the women in the community uh, occupy violence. First, they are uh, women who are victims of years, decades of neglect by the state but there are also women that are victims of the jihadists and state militaries uh, and private military companies. But there are women who are an integral part of that community who see themselves uh, as part of, if the insurgency is seen as a revolution, they see themselves as part of the revolution. 
And the intervention is not only a rehumanization uh, of women who have been, on whose board this war is being transacted, but it's also uh, the ability to address what Nyanka referred to. The fact that the state has not been present for these women in many respects, social, economic, and political. And so the holistic approach, and Pascal, uh, you know, I, I mean, Pascal sobering reminders about the splendid failure of leadership cannot be substituted by the excellence of guns. The Mozambican challenge will not be resolved purely in military terms. And the warning that in doing a regional integration, apart from uh, re-victimizing people who are already traumatized and internationalizing the crisis, it's useful that the regional response be value and values led, that it, it must re result in transformation in Northern Mozambique. Otherwise, all we're doing is constructing a false peace, uh, you know, the insurgents will just uh, migrate to elsewhere within the, 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 the broader region. And, and which, which I think Peter uh, raised this issue about are they Islamists or not? I mean, colleagues, uh, um, they have said they are. Uh, we will not go into their hearts or heads. Whether they are saying it purely in order to get resourcing from ISIS, or, and we've seen this with Boko Haram. If, uh, if uh, Pascal was still on, online, he would tell you that a certain faction in Boko Haram trying to associate itself with ISIS. It's, it's natural. Uh, these groups, uh, that's how they, 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 they operate. So I would say that if you are looking at the condition of women and children within this context and the developmental condition, you would have to have a fairly... I, I, I've been to the north. Uh, it's a, one of the most preeminently beautiful parts of Mozambique Violet. Uh, the state has not invested in the north for a long time. The extent of dilapidation is unbelievable. And therefore, the very fact that it is a forgotten part of the country and yet is so wealthy, not in terms of natural resources only, but in terms of just the aesthetic, natural beauty of the place, underinvestment in education, underinvestment in healthcare, underinvestment in all sorts of things that are essential. So our response is you can have infrastructure, you can have these developmental interventions that don't take into account the humanity, uh, especially of the women and the young people, because they are in the majority in that part of the country. So I would say, a military intervention would require our armies to have a totally different mindset to that described by Alex. Number two, a developmental intervention would have to have the lens that seek to address the consistent feminization of poverty that we have seen, uh, and also the generational challenge in question. And underlying the so-called religious conflict are ethnic dynamics within the North, because the assumption is that the entire North is uh, Muslim. It's not. The North has got a different set of religious uh, affinities that would need to be taken into account. So I would say to everybody wishing to assist Mozambique, we must stop the spread of radical uh, violent extremism. However, we will not do it with bullets and guns only. We have to do it with development, with greater inclusion, greater participation, and the rehumanization of these people who've been dehumanized by the state and dehumanized by some of these big corporates that are coming into their territory. Thank you, Brian. Final words, Alex? Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, first of all, thanks to, to everybody who has uh, played a role in, in organizing uh, this important event. I have also learned a lot from it. Uh, as as a participant, um, I, I I should say that the 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 crisis is multidimensional. The point that has been made, and I think Brian has uh, made the point very well in his presentation and, and in his conclusion, it's a multidimensional uh, crisis, uh, which therefore means that the solution uh, is not just a military solution. 
the solution has to be multidimensional as well. Uh, whoever intervenes is intervening not for the purposes of using guns and drones alone, but also for the purposes of uh, really understanding and developing solutions to the complex uh, problems that exist within those communities. And I think that is, uh, that is an important consideration. One of the things that I have learned also from this discussion is uh, that the crisis in Cabo Delgado is also in many ways a domestic uh, crisis in terms of the relationship between uh, people or a community that has been excluded uh, in terms of development, in terms of attention by its own government. And therefore, this is a problem for the Mozambican state. Now, uh, I mention this because it is important for other African states, including African states uh, that want to intervene in Mozambique. Uh, it, it, it's almost a case of people who have problems in their own homes. Uh, intervening to try and solve problems in another home. Uh, I think that it is important for uh, countries within the region to look very carefully at what is happening in Cabo Delgado and draw lessons from it in relation to how they deal with communities in their own countries. And if they are excluded communities, those excluded communities may end up behaving in precisely the same ways is what we are seeing in Mozambique. And this is why there is always an encouragement, hmm, an exhortation that countries must encourage better governance, eh? that they must look after excluded communities, that they must look after vulnerable groups. Because if they don't do that, they are creating pockets of disaffection, pockets that are easy to exploit. And I think it's important for those of us who are looking with a view to intervening and assisting Mozambique to make sure that we also settle those challenges that we have in our own countries. And I talk here in particular in relation to our own Zimbabwe, which is its own very large and disaffected community. It, 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 it is an act of hypocrisy, some people might say, to, to want to help uh, others when you are unable to help yourself. I think it's important to really look into that. Uh, another issue by way of conclusion is of course the issue of constitutionalism, ensuring that whatever we do uh, from a Zimbabwean perspective is done in a manner uh, that respects the constitutional arrangements, that respects the governance arrangements, uh, within within our country. This is important for transparency. It's also important for accountability. We have seen in previous wars that there has been no transparency, that there has been no accountability. And this is why people are always very skeptical whenever the government wants to do even things that seem to be for a good cause. It is because of the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability. And I want to conclude with the issue of corruption. I already mentioned in my presentation the problem of corruption that we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. There are certain people who have an uncanny ability to make the most out of bad situations. And we have seen that with the COVID-19 pandemic in Zimbabwe and in other countries. I'm sure they've also encountered similar problems and my concern, of course, is that uh, the elites who hover around the top echelons of the state, they are looking at the intervention in Mozambique, if it does come, as an opportunity. You know, public procurement, supply of resources, and so forth. They are looking at this and they are seeing a huge opportunity to make a lot of money. My view is that uh, whatever happens, civil society, the opposition, everybody who is concerned, whether it's in Zimbabwe, it's in Malawi, it's in Zambia, it's in South Africa, or wherever, there has really to be a proper way in which you have, have vigilance over the use of resources and the potential exploitation that is likely to, 
to take place in this crisis. And uh, uh, those who are concerned in this area, I think that they need to really take a particular attention. And of course, the issue of humanitarian uh, uh, assistance. Uh, some people in the comments have been making very legitimate points about the impact on women, the impact on children, the impact on vulnerable groups, the disabled, and so forth. It's very easy for us to focus on the hardware aspects of intervention and forget the software, you know, the small bits, uh, the, 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 the issues that are easily, uh, easily forgotten. Uh, Brian has, has spoken about the impact on vulnerable groups. The other people in the uh, comments have also raised this issue. And I think it needs a, a lot of attention. It needs to be taken into account uh, in whatever we do. I, I hope that there will be more discussions of this nature involving more people, in particular, uh, more people from Mozambique. I would have loved to hear more from Mozambicans, uh, those who are uh, in the thick of things, those who are closer to the scene. Uh, but I would like to say thank you so much for uh, having this and starting it. It's a, it's a good uh, start to conversations that should be happening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Alex and uh, Brian. Um, we were not able to get back Professor Adriano uh, Novunga and Piers uh, Pegu back because of uh, connection difficulties. And we also had several people from uh, Mozambique who had joined us on uh, this Zoom call. But unfortunately, I think it was to do with the internet connection. We were not able to get them back. However, we thank them for their contributions. We thank you, Brian and Alex, and also thank all of you who joined us on Zoom and also on Facebook. Um, this has really been uh, an interesting discussion. We got some interesting insights into the critical situation in Mozambique and uh, the region. Some here have also said that this might be an opportunity for Zimbabwe to show leadership. Well, time will tell. <laughs> we'll see what happens in the near future. Um, and before we leave, I'd like to say thank you to the group of Politics and Beyond for organizing this very important event. Stay safe, everyone, and see you soon. Asante sana. Good night. Asante sana. <laughs> <laughs> <What's that? laughs> good night, everyone. <laughs>